All right. I have with me here today, Terry Hansen Mead. Welcome to the show, Terry. Thanks for having me. It's fantastic to be on here. Yeah, I'm excited to see you. Uh, Terry is the award-winning author of a blog called Piloting Your Life. And she's an advocate for women through all of her other platforms. She is an angel investor, or maybe currently she describes herself as a former angel investor. That's what we're here to talk about. Focused on investing in startups and um, it, that expand the power and influence of women. She's based in Redwood City. She's the mother of two college age kids. And in her spare time, what else? She flies helicopters around the San Francisco Bay Area. So I'm excited to chat with you today. Why don't we just get started? How did you get interested in angel investing? Well, it's interesting. So I've spent um, the last 25 years working in and with biotech, man, uh, medical device, diagnostic, and digital health companies. And okay. about eight years ago, I got tired of bashing my head against uh, the arrogance of science um, because I am all about leveraging data and technology to optimize business performance and get to market faster. And life sciences tends to be a little bit behind the times and doesn't necessarily appreciate technology. So I was talking to a helicopter pilot buddy of mine and just like, I need to be doing something different. And he suggested that I look into angel investing. And what I didn't really realize at the time was my dad, many years ago, he was the first check into Trinet and he was an angel investor, but really didn't share with me that this was something that I could do. We'd been investing in stuff over the prior 20 years. And so we were accredited investors. Um, but I just didn't even know this was something that I could do. It wasn't something that I was, you know, encouraged to do. But when Stu suggested it, I thought, hmm, let me just go ahead and check it out. Okay. And so for the folks who are listening, who maybe d don't know really what angel investing is, how would you describe it? I sort of think of it. Angel is, angels tend to do the, the seed rounds and then if the companies get big enough, VCs take over or tell me how you think about that. The way that I look at it is um, VCs or venture capitalists um, invest other people's monies, money into startups um, at various, various stages. Whereas angels, we invest our own money. It was probably assumed that way back in the day or early on that angels only invested in early, early stage. So there was usually a friends and family round, which was a smaller round. And then there were pre-seed, seed, post-seed, pre peach seed, mango seed. I mean, we have all of these different <laughs> seeds. I know all these different seeds now. It's a fruit it's orchard happening. <laughs> Well, help help it grow. So the um, the assumption was that angels were really in those early stages, and that later there would be um, more I institutional money in terms of the professional investors or the VCs. What we've seen over the last ten years is really kind of the democratization of angel investing or investing into startups, and so. Um, I've invested into Series A. I've invested into Series B. In fact, uh, one of my first checks might have been into a Series B, uh, which would not have been really available um, probably a long time ago. But um, it, the the whole dynamics have changed because now you have institutional investors or v VCs investing in very early stages so that they can then get access to um, to opportunities um at earlier stages so it's really become really just kind of a, a big mess now oh kind of a free-for-all it is it is a complete and total free-for-all okay uh you know one of the things that i think is really interesting is that you know if you watch shark tank you may get the idea that investors are there to select through their skill and wisdom the companies that were already going to be successful right but if you look at uh, kind of reverse the role or reverse the perspective there, there's a lot of reason to to think and, and say that, I mean, companies need capital to be successful. So in many ways, VCs and investors in early stage companies are changing the landscape of what's available. Like they're in many ways, effectuating the world. Uh, yeah, that is one of my <laughs> big frustrations and why, as you said in the intro, I'm pretty much a former angel investor at this point. Um, my checkbook isn't large enough to affect the change that I think we need to see, um, especially right now in this um, economic downturn. Um, yeah, 92% of the VCs as of a couple of years ago were men, and 47 or 48% of them came from two different college, two different universities. 
So basically, you've got a a large male uh, population making the decision on what gets funded in the world, which means they get to decide what is in the world. And it's been one of my really big frustrations. It's one of the reasons why I started my podcast, Piloting Your Life, um, five years ago, uh, how I got to write my book, Piloting Your Life, um, in 2019, and why I get up on a platform every time I can or on my soapbox to encourage women to invest, to encourage non-cisgendered, heterosexual white men to invest so that we can affect what gets um, what gets uh, produced in the world, what gets funded. 95% um, of the world was designed by and for men. I mean, we can think about seatbelts. We can think about um, crash test dummies within vehicles. We can, you know, the healthcare system that is largely designed for healthy white men. Um, I mean, there's so many different things that, uh, yeah. So the, the people who have the decision-making power, the check-writing power within um, early stage investing are the ones who decide what, what exists in our world. Right. And so is that what attracted you to it? Was it, was it, was it to express yourself as simply said as an activist? No, actually, that didn't come until later um, oh. because I really didn't know how out of balance it was. You know, being in life sciences um, for so many years, uh, you know, especially in the San Francisco Bay Area, I'm in a bit of a I was in a bit of a bubble. And I, I actually got to the point where I was embarrassed going to cocktail parties and not knowing, you know, who the PayPal mafia was, you know, who the founders of Google were. Um, who a number of people are that so many people in this very tech centric um, world, a, a lot of people knew and I didn't because life sciences is its own special little little world. It's been a very lucrative world for me, but it's one that um, I would go and I'd feel a little bit left out of, you know, uh, what was going on in the in the rest of the world around here in the Bay Area. I got into it because I needed to figure out where I could add value, where I could have fun, what I would, what I could do as a consultant. So I've been consulting for 18 years uh, at this point. At that point, it was um, 10 years. And I was like, I needed to figure out what my next step was. And so I thought angel investing would give me an opportunity to learn more, get exposed to more. And what I fell in love with actually was the learning. I loved learning about new things. It's one of the reasons why I love consulting is I get to learn things in one place and apply it in another place. And that's what I got to do in angel investing. I could not learn enough fast enough to understand not only what the, what the market opportunities were, what the competitive landscape was for potential um, investment opportunities, but also to see how I could then potentially bring some of that technology back into a very old school, slow moving in the technology, uh, from a technology perspective in life sciences. Once I saw what the makeup of the investors were, um, how the women were treated specifically um, by the investors, um, then I think I became more of an activist and then realized that I really needed to make a difference, not only with building a platform, but also um, encouraging other people to vote with their pocketbooks, to make decisions on who got funded um, every day, not just in our investments, but where we shop um, and have those dollars be more aligned with, with our values um, from a human perspective. So it's, so it started that you wanted to bring technology into life sciences and then quickly became a more gender advocacy role for you. That's Absolutely. Accurate. I just, you know, I, I was able to see very quickly um, and hear very quickly because I listened to a whole bunch of podcasts because angel investing is hard, super it steep is. learning, super steep learning curve to do it. Well, you really need to be immersed in it a lot. I got to the point where I took a little bit of a break from my consulting and I was doing it about 40 to 50 hours a week unpaid, you know, so I was, I was taking a little bit of a break because I thought if I'm going to do this, I need to do this. Well, I'm going to be taking our money that, well, I, my husband would say my money because my husband stayed home with the kids for 12 years while I worked, okay. um, but we would be taking our money and investing it into a very risky asset class. I mean, it has the potential for some big upside, but 
it's pretty risky, especially when you're investing at the early stage. And when I came to find out investing as an angel um, investor at the early stages, there are some decisions that are made later on by the founders and the later stage um, investors that make it very difficult to make a lot of money as an as an angel investor, um, which I wrote about in a in a blog post. Uh, yeah, follow up on that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, when an entrepreneurial when, a, when an executive team becomes successful and they have an exit, they they want to get paid. They aren't necessarily loyal to their investors, which is I think something people don't really realize when they get into it is that you could make a good they also get very pressured by later stage investors who are going to be writing significantly bigger checks and so while they may want to be may want to reward the loyalty of early stage investors uh if they want to grow if they want to get to a meaningful exit which is why a lot of them are doing it then they are unduly influenced by the later stage investors and the terms that um, then tend to supersede the earlier terms that may have been more beneficial to the earlier stage investors. So when I was jumping into it and I was listening to a lot of podcasts and trying to read books and articles to learn as much as I could to be a good investor, um, I realized it was the white bro show and it was all of the same, it was all of the same people in the same room and it was this echo chamber. And I thought, none of these people represent me. None of, I can't relate to their experiences. And I realized that there are a lot of people out there who cannot be it if they can't see it. And I think that was one of the, that was my wake up call to when I decided to get a lot more vocal and um, be a bigger advocate for those that didn't look like that small, small percentage of people representing. Interesting. And so I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier, and then I want to ask you about how you and your husband thought about your family financials. But you mentioned what things changed for you when you saw how female entrepreneurs were treated by angel investors. Can you give me, give us a couple examples of that that you remember? Oh my God, it was horrifying. <laughs> so in, so my first two years as an angel investor, I was with Sandhill Angels. And um, within a year, I was on the board. I was responsible for deal flow um, and uh, partnerships with um, VCs. Because as uh, you know, we put the early money in, but we had to have relationships with the VCs to make sure that we could pass those deals off for the next round to other right. investors to get um, additional checks. And we would, there would be pitch events or um, the invest, the founders would come in and pitch to us as a group. Um, there were very few women who were a part of the group and the women would get up there and there were so many men in the room who would ask questions to make themselves look good and make the founders feel very, very small. And I, I often wondered about that whole dynamic. Um, but there was one example in particular. Um, it was a husband and wife and the, the wife was the, the CEO, but it was a co-founder. So her husband was also there. And they had a, a device for the kitchen where you, this was when these were all very, very popular, where you could set it up in the morning, have it set with a timer or control it with an app so that when you got home, you actually had a, um, a hot, healthy meal, um, which was, you know, it's important when you have two uh, busy working partners or your parent, you know, you're, uh, you have a family. And so you're busy parents trying to, to feed, et cetera. And one of the guys said, I I can't imagine. I I don't know why people need this. I don't need something like this. Now, mind you, this guy was probably 60, 65. I don't think his wife had ever worked. They probably had some additional help within the house. uh, People who were helping with the shopping and the cleaning and the, the food prep and everything else. And he couldn't practice what I call radical empathy to understand that somebody else might have a different lived experience. It doesn't actually seem that radical, but yes. Like what you're asking for, for him to understand that some people have families where both partners work. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and I'm like, how can you be a good investor if you can't imagine that somebody else might have different needs of your uh, different needs from your own? But that was when I had discovered the concept of radical empathy. And I can't remember the author who coined the term, but it was like imagining that there might be someone who has a different lived experience from 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 your own. 
And I saw a couple of opportunity, a couple of times where some of the investors in the room asked just completely tone deaf questions. And I realized that the way that they asked the questions was was tone deaf. And it was also very belittling to the founders who were presenting, especially if it was women. And I also saw that the questions that they asked the women were really um, more defensive and less about seeing what the opportunities are, less about seeing um, what the bigger vision was, um, to really fully understand um, what the opportunity was versus the way I saw them treating the men. Yeah, I have seen such things. Um, so in the beginning, you said you'd give angel investing two years and $55,000. So what's the total tally of your time and investment when all said and done? Uh, $300,000 and I think 22 investments. Um, and uh, that the 300,000 were checks written to companies, um, either directly as part of Sandhill Angels, as part of syndicates or into um, actual VC funds so that somebody else can put our money to work. Um, in addition to that, there was a significant amount of travel um, meetings. Um, I went to Helsinki twice for Slush. I sponsored my own investing tour in, I think it was June of 2018 when I went to Europe. I went to Paris, Tallinn, Estonia. I spoke at an event in Berlin and I went to Nice. Um, largely because here in the Silicon Valley, it's very easy to become part of, become very myopic and think that innovation only happens here when right. innovation happens everywhere. Um, and so getting outside of this bubble is incredibly important. Um, it got to the point where I, I actually stopped investing in Bay Area based, um, startups because it just got to be too expensive and too competitive. And I wanted to invest in problems that were being solved by people outside of the Bay Area because, you know, we are a funky little bubble. Well, diversification is a good thing. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, share with us what you're willing to say about how you and your husband thought about, you know, for example, there's the opportunity cost of you not working, but then mm -hmm. there's the $300,000 that you invested, all of which it could be, it could have gone to zero. It is not unthinkable that that principle would have been lost. So how did you make sure that you had enough financial wiggle room to do that? Well, we had been pretty savvy um, about putting away money and setting aside um, money. My husband, very early on, we realized a, I was going to, I had greater financial earning opportunities. I'm a lot more ambitious than he is. And um, also as a former accountant, financial analyst, um, I just, I just pay more attention to this. And so when we kind of split up our roles and responsibilities, he basically was like, well, if you think we can afford this, if you think this is the right thing for us, then you have my support a hundred percent. So we didn't really, there weren't really many conversations about it beyond that. Hmm. I would share with them some of the investment opportunities and I would just say, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? He'd ask some questions, but for the most part, he'd be like, I have to defer to you. You, you know, if you're comfortable doing this, then I support it 100%. Okay. But then for yourself, so, so, so then what you're saying is you being the financial analyst in the marital team, you looked at your, the nest egg that you had in 2015 or whenever you made this decision. Do I have the, I think I have the year, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. April of 2015. <laughs> And you decided I can lessen my earned income and do this for a while. I mean, it's essentially you're sort of part-time retired well, from I a guess financial I perspective. It was, it was more of a slingshot type of thing where um, I had to take a step back financially and with some of my work in order to be able to spring forward, um, okay. so, which is kind of how we saw it. We saw it as an investment of my time and an investment of our financial resources that could potentially catapult us further from a financial perspective. Um, I felt like I was really stuck in a hole with the consulting that I was doing in the space. And mm -hmm. um, we both agreed that it would be my real life PhD. So rather than me going back to school to get a doctorate, 
that this was in essence my real life PhD. So I, 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 did, I wouldn't say that I was retired. I would just say that I was taking some time to, to educate myself to figure out what the next opportunity was going to be. Um, I mean, it, we did take a financial hit, obviously, in doing that. Um, but hopefully some of those investments don't go to zero based on the last funding round for for all of them. And I update our financials on a monthly basis. So I know exactly where we stand at the end of every month um, and then take a look at our cash forecast for the for the next year. So I can see what we're up to. If we're ever going to be able to retire, you know, at 53, that's kind of a question when I'm expected to live another 50 years and I have two, <laughs> kids, in, two kids in college. Um, Thank, but, thankful you know, to the life sciences, <laughs> but longevity is a pr problem for finances. <laughs> <laughs> longevity is a financial problem. It's a financial problem, but it's one that, you know, I'm actively working on. But, it, you know, based on it, it hopefully one of them looks like it's going to cover our initial investments a couple times over. So hopefully that plays out, but um, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how that one goes. So it wasn't really a, a retirement. I would say that right now I'm kind of in the middle of an accidental um, midlife sabbatical, which I'm kind of exploring and going to be doing a little bit more writing about, largely because I'm continuing to refine and retool my consulting. So one of the things that I I just see that that break from my consulting allowed me to reposition, learn more, and kind of re-strategize the work that I wanted to be doing. And I'm back again in a similar position, and it's it coincides with the end of my angel investing, whereas the other one was the beginning of my angel investing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you haven't necessarily, I mean, you published the article I saw about why you decided to stop angel investing, I think in March of this year. So it's only been about 60 days, right? Yeah. yeah it hasn't yeah. been very long. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the logistics of making investments into seed round firms. Uh, were you intimidated to make your first investment? What was that like? Oh, I was intimidated by the whole entire process. You know, I walked into the room. I did not... I was like, who am I among all of these these supposedly successful people? Very quickly, I saw that the emperor did not have any clothes for a lot of them. But um, the my first check in was to a company called My Health Teams. It was a ten thousand dollar check. Um, one would expect that I should have been more intimidated. I probably should have been a lot more thoughtful about it. But as with a lot of things, sometimes I just have to go for it. Um, rip the Band-Aid off in order to be able to move forward. I think if I'd spent more time analyzing and thinking about it, I probably wouldn't have written the check. The company is still around. The company is still doing really, really well. Um, I don't expect an exit for a couple of years on that one, largely because right now we're just in a really strange uh, economic um Economically, it's just a really strange time, and I don't see many exits for the next two years. But um, the the thing about angel investing, as I said earlier, it's a very steep learning curve, and you only learn by doing. You can read all the books. You can listen to all the podcasts. Um, but until you do your first one you or your second or your third or your fourth, the, the knowledge builds up. There's so many terms. There's There's so much not even just about the company you're investing in, but the 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 nature of the deal, the terms of the deal. Is it a convertible right. note? Is it a safe? Is it a, um, you know, is it a pre or a post valuation safe? Is it a priced round? Is it, you know, what what is it? And then there are all sorts of specific terms that are in there that vary from deal to deal. So I probably should have been intimidated, but I was really excited about the team. I was excited about the opportunity. And even though they say, wait a year until you make your first investment as an angel investor, I basically went to my first meeting as a Sand Hill Angels member, saw my health teams and said, I need to invest in this company. <laughs> Okay, so just so people have a sense of what the experience can be like, you made that investment in 2015 and no real idea, like it may be a couple multiple exit, but not anytime soon. So in essence, nothing has been repaid to you at this time from that particular investment? 
That's, that is true. I have had, of the 22 investments that I have made, I made one investment in 2017, I think, which ended up, uh, that company got acquired, I think, in 2019. I got my money back um, on that. I've had one other investment that I made last year, which I asked them to do a dollar buyback on because I wanted off their cap table. I think, I don't think they're going, actually, I know they're going down fast. Um, so I lost money on that one. There's another one that, um, my second investment from November of 2015, uh, was that company was acquired by another company. Um, and there's a revenue share situation with that. I probably will not get my full investment back, but who knows, because I get a little bit every year. Uh, and then there's one other company that I think is going down. Um, but otherwise, all of the other investments that I have made have not realized any sort of return. Okay. Okay. Good. I mean, not good, but thank you for giving us the <laughs> landscape of that. <laughs> Uh, like I said, I mean, I think the idea of angel investing or investing in seed stage companies is very aspirational for people. It's exciting. Um, and I just think it's important that people get a real sense of what it actually looks like on the, on the inside. Um, yeah, so, one of the, absolutely. so one of the things I thought was really interesting was you wrote that, first of all, male investors passed off female teams to you without even considering investing in those companies and then that those females would expect free work from you support uh, probably emotional and financial and if you didn't give it they told you you don't support women yeah that was that, that was really that was actually really really tough and it got exhausting there was this expectation that as a woman investor that i build the the ecosystem not just for women but for non-white men. Um, so black people, brown people, gay people, um, that there was ex is this ex expectation that I'd be a part of building it, building the opportunities, making the introductions, supporting the companies, whereas my white cisgendered men counterparts didn't, there wasn't the same expectation from that, from them. And I really didn't realize that until I was at uh, an angel summit playing poker with some some guys. And one of the guys talked about his experience and he got to just go to events, get pitch deals, make decisions on deals and then write checks and be done. Um, he didn't he wasn't expected to help support the company, build the company, make introductions, um, help strategize, be the sh shoulder to cry on be the, you know, get the call. Well, it, there was one call I got from a founder in the back, uh, in the bathtub. I hadn't actually invested in her company, but she was dealing with some major sexual harassment from a potential investor. And she was calling to ask me what to do. You know, um, I don't think I will ever forget that, that horrible, horrible call. Oh my. Um, but the, I, yeah, the women, the, well, let me take a step back. So what did you tell her to do? I'm sorry. What did you tell her to do? What was your advice to her? Well, we had to talk through it because her company was on the brink and we had to talk through what it meant to not take that money. Yeah. You know, cause it was, it was, it was, she was going to have to take the money. If she took the money, it was going to be on some pretty gross terms. And if she didn't, there was a possibility her company would not be out around the following month. And right. we talked through it. And um, she ended up deciding that not all money is created equal and not all money is worth it. She ended up finding um, some, uh, she ended up finding some other investors that were more aligned. And so she was able to walk away from that, but it was really, really very tough. Yeah. As for the other men investors who would just pass stuff off, yeah, they would get sent a deal or pitched a deal and there was a woman involved that would be like, not mine, we're sending it to Terry. This happened at Sand Hill over and over again and even after oh I left. My goodness. Bills. Yeah, that somehow just because I'm a woman, I know everything and could help help everyone. And I liked helping. And as a recovering people pleaser, you know, I would wanted to say yes, but over time as my reputation 
grew, um, as more people knew what I was investing in, then it just, it got completely overwhelming to the point where I resented every single email coming because it was always a request for request for help request for a check. And no matter how gracefully I tried to respond and say, Hey, I'm really busy or I'm limited on this, or I'm not investing in that. There were a couple women who got pretty nasty and were like, I thought you helped women. And I'm like, I do, but I can't help all of them. I don't have Melinda Gates's checkbook. Right. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm not really- here to incinerate money. <laughs> well, there's that too. I mean, I still have to, I still have to fund our lifestyle. Right. Um, very interesting and disheartening and remind me, actually, I'm surprised this is the first time since I first read your article that I've thought of, you know, I just happened to, I don't read all of Tim Ferriss's emails, but he stopped angel investing. Um, and you know, he said similar things about how, um, the, the, the activity just mushroomed into something he could not and would not manage. Right. He just said, it seems like if you do a little bit of it, it can take over your whole life. And there's no way to like, or in an organized fashion, mitigate that. Uh, Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I can't even imagine with Tim Ferriss's notoriety. um, I imagine the the requests would be absolutely overwhelming. And then I think there would be the expectation that he, you know, he's a big name probably has a much bigger, you know, he has a much bigger checkbook. Like why, why couldn't he just put $25,000 into my company? What, what is it? Right. Who does he think he is that he doesn't see that what I'm doing is so fantastic? You know, I, I imagine that there are some people who, who think that way. Cause, and really what it comes down to is a lot of companies that seek out angel investors are not necessarily good, um, angel or VC backable companies. So Mm. there's, there's, you know, we talked about how really how difficult it is to be a very educated, knowledgeable, um, angel investor. It takes a lot of time because you need to understand the financial aspect of it, the legal aspect of it. You also have to understand the, 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 the competitive landscape of a particular company, the market opportunity. Are these the right people? I mean, there's so much that goes into it. For a ten thousand dollar check, well, I think it, I think it, my average check ended up being closer to fifteen to twenty five thousand at, at the end of that. Um, but a lot of them were looking for much larger tax checks, fifty to fifty to two hundred fifty thousand dollar checks. Um, right. The the seed pre seed rounds went from five hundred thousand to three to five million dollars. I mean it it got it got exponentially crazy. Um, and at the same time, you've got a whole bunch of founders who think they have um, have startups that are going to have humongous exits that somehow warrant angel investors. And so um, you talked about how sexy this has become. Everybody thinks they have a VC backable venture investable opportunity, and they're not all um, going to have the humongous re- returns. So um, it's, it's the, the pressure. So even if I would practice radical candor and, you know, give feedback with love and say, hey, I think, you know, maybe you should look at some alternate financing. I think you're going to have a tough time getting subsequent, subsequent rounds of investors, largely because the exit opportunity really isn't big enough to attract um, venture, you know, VCs who are accountable to their investors who their limited partners you know, you might want to look at something else. And that wasn't always taken um, kindly. What's the average age of of entrepreneurs who are pitching you, would you say? Oh, my gosh. Um, uh, I I couldn't even give you the average age. Well, probably somewhere between 35 and 45, I think. That's older than I thought you were going to say. Um, well, there, I mean, there were a lot in their 20s, but I also intentionally sought out um, older founders, largely because mm. I would invest, I, I like to invest in experience. Like I would go to 500 startups events where there are 20, 21, 22 year olds who have these, you know, huge ideas with no previous work experience. And they would somehow get people to invest in them. I'm like, they have no track record. And I just wouldn't invest with people who didn't really have some sort of a track record minimum of having a job out of college. 
<laughs> you would think, you would think. <laughs> um, so if I, I'm trying to think how I want to ask this, one of my final questions. So most free markets sort of naturally develop pretty well, pretty effectively with uh, competition and, and ingenuity, like things tend to turn out in the free market. For the most part, there's externalities, but that's not the point. So this market kind of didn't turn out that great. The whole how entrepreneurs who need capital funding to get started go to investors, as you've described, angels and VCs, no diversification. What, how would you say, what would you say if you could wave a magic wand what does this activity need to do to fix it? Well, I think we need greater diversification in the investor population. We need to have, um, it can't skew 92% male VCs with, as I said, 47, 48% coming from the same two colleges. Yeah. Um, and the majority of the money coming out of Silicon Valley. It's just so skewed the you know money is power and right now the the power is in the hands of a select few who are making all of those decisions so to wave um, a magic wand i would change that power balance and make it so that um there's a more equal spread a more equitable spread of the capital so then the decisions that are made on being what's being funded in the world are really more representative of the makeup of our population and our needs within our society. It sounds like what I'm working on in financial services, very similar. Oh, it's it's happening, it's happening slowly. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. You know, yeah. Money is uh, power. Great. Shift it. Money is power when it comes to because businesses eat time and money. So <laughs> he or she who has more money has more possibilities. So, Terry, you, now you've got your PhD. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> What's next for you? What are you excited about now? Well, I'm excited that we're recent empty nesters. So we are trying on a more nomadic lifestyle, except for the empty nest puppy that I got who ties us down a little bit. Um, and I'm, strateg I'm strategizing on how to position my consulting so that I can be more of a compliance and technology strategist and do less day-to-day -day project type stuff. I'm also, so I'm partnering with other consulting firms so that I can have broader reach. Um, I'm also working on expanding my expert witness practice so that for failed technology projects, um, I can, you know, go in, provide an opinion, you know, be a part of a deposition uh, and potentially, you know, uh, do less work at a higher fee so that I yep. can have more, more free time. Um, and then also taking a closer look at, um, our portfolio and what we need to do to continue to diversify, um, put our money to work in areas that align with our values. Yeah, very good. Uh, I definitely know expert witness work can be very lucrative. So may you make lots of money. <laughs> yeah, so then I can influence. You know, I was listening to to one of the interviews of one of the gals um, on the podcast. I think it was from 2022, where she talked about making a lot of money and being able to do good with her money. And that is one of the things that my husband and I really want to do as well. We don't plan on leaving a legacy, a financial legacy to our kids. You know, we'll support them through our lifetime. We want to live comfortably, but we also want to influence the things that we think are, are most important. Um, education, uh, a safe and healthy environment for all, um, you know, primarily education, because <laughs> we see education as a foundation. Um, lack of education is the root of all evil, and education is a, a solution to that. So um, we're just looking for ways to you know, do good with um, how fortunate we've been in our lifetime. That's amazing. Congratulations on your self-actualization and your uh, ben ben benevolence and benevolence. It's nice to, <laughs> it's nice to be connected. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, letting me talk about this. I'm still processing a lot about my experience as an angel investor. I'm very grateful to the opportunity for the opportunity um, I also a little bit concerned about how sexy, um, I keep using that word cause it's your word, 
um, <laughs> how sexy uh, the world has made angel investor angel investing seem. Um, and I think we really need to see some significant changes with the financial market to make it so um, it's a little less sexy because it's a quite a bit of a gamble. Um, but at least get find a way to get funding into the hands of the of the founders, entrepreneurs, and business owners to you know do the good work in our world. Well, I think it's hard for people to grapple with that, even for successful venture capital firms. I mean, I think it's still the common wisdom is 90% or more of their portfolio companies fail, um, yeah. right? They yeah. don't come to fruition. Um, and so, and that's just hard for people to really wrap their brains around. Yeah. Um, so tell people, I was reading your article on medium.com, but tell people where to find you on the internet. Um, well, um, terryhansonmead.com, you can find me there. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Instagram, Terry Hanson Mead. And then um, my book, uh, Piloting Your Life, is available on Amazon in audio, ebook, and paperback. Amazing. We'll include the links in the show being here. Thanks for having me.